It's funny, Benjamin, you said it had a couple of babies. I can't tell you how often people say, how many kids do you have now? I'm like four, we just had our fourth, but I have to count them too. So, <laughs> uh, I do know their names, so we're good. All right, so I have been tasked with giving a response. Uh, I do have a PowerPoint that I think it will be coming up, but uh, before I do that, let me just say thank you to each of the presenters. Um, I love to nerd out on these conversations, so I just appreciate the time and the effort that each of you have put into this work, uh, and, and we don't take that lightly, so thank you for the efforts there. I've enjoyed it. Let me give you kind of a, an overview of where we're going, tell you where we're going, what we're doing, what I'm planning to do. First and foremost, I'm going to lay out some uh, presuppositions and assumptions, give you my perspective of where I'm coming from, uh, because as I give these kind of response points, uh, it matters where I'm coming from. And so I'm working from some very basic assumptions, uh, and I just want you to be aware of those as we go into this conversation. Uh, I also do that because I am a faculty advisor for numerous PhD students. And as Kelsey will tell you, I say over and over, claim your assumptions, make clear your assumptions. So uh, I have to do what I tell Kelsey to do. Secondly, uh, I want to do a few things in this response. Um, Cesar, can you? Oh, I have it. Look at that. Green button. All right. The second thing is I want to walk through each uh, each uh, presentation and just give an overview of what it was. I think all of you have been here for most of them, but just to refresh our memories, bring it all together. I'll give you some summary. I'll give some personal thoughts. Then I want to draw some kind of common threads. There are some themes that I have picked up amongst multiple talks during uh, the last two days, um, and I've enjoyed seeing those pop up in different ways. So I want to tie some things together. And then lastly, I want to make some points of application, both as a counselor and an educator. Um, I would contend that every person in this room is in some form or fashion, both a counselor and an educator. Um, all of us have to apply our theology. Uh, some of you are being trained to do that in specific ways, but all of you are doing those things. So I want to make some points of application. And then lastly, I believe we'll have just a few minutes for final discussion uh, and thoughts. Right. So my perspective, I live in the applied theology world. I'm an applied theologian. Uh, now, I, I love that space and I hate that space uh, because I can't stay way up here. And when we talk about matters of theology, when we talk about matters of formation, uh, it comes into uh, reality for the person sitting in my office on my couch. Uh, these things matter, things like attachment, things like empirical evidence, those things matter uh, because I'm looking at someone who is hurting and in need of help. Uh, so as I give some thoughts, just see it from that lens that there's an application that has to come out of what we're doing and what we're thinking. The second presupposition, I think we would all agree on this one, but just to be clear, I value, deeply value God's revelation in both his word in his world, in both books. Uh, I value that, and yet I will give clear priority to Scripture over creation, okay, for a numerous, uh, numerous reasons, but lay that presupposition out. Uh, the third perspective piece is that I am not an expert in all of these fields that we've talked about. Uh, there's been words that have been used that I've thought, okay, I know that word. Hold on, let me think about it for a second. Um, so I'm a bit of an outsider looking in on some of these discussions, some more than others. Um, so in saying that, as I'm giving the summary to the presentations, uh, if I am sharing, fellow presenters, something that's incorrect, please correct me. Uh, let's have, we can have a dialogue about that. I want to represent you fairly uh, and appropriately, all right? I'm going to walk through them in the order that we walked through them over the last two days. The first presentation was from Dr. Miller, Dr. Christian Miller, and his uh, presentation was Empirical Evidence for Spiritual Formation. And at the very beginning, Dr. Miller laid out kind of this twofold tasks. He asked two sorts of questions. One, is it reasonable for us to make predictions about spiritual formation in Christians versus non-Christians. So can we reasonably presume that if we look at Christians and we look at non-Christians, that there's some sort of difference in them, an, an ideally positive difference in Christians versus 
non-Christians. And the second task of that is, does the empirical evidence play that out? Does the science uh, reflect that presupposition, this hypothesis, if we test it, is it played out? And he walked through uh, this exploration, if you will, of, of testing these hypotheses is in some ways problematic. Uh, and I was thinking this as you were talking, Dr. Miller, is, wow, there's a lot of definitions of terms here. Uh, and so there's some problematic um, issues with testing these hypotheses. And one of those is defining those differences. So for instance, when we say Christian, what do we mean by Christian? Uh, are they evangelical? Are they Protestant or Catholic? Uh, who is this Christian? Uh, but similarly with non-Christians, are they atheist? Are they Buddhist? Are they Jewish? Will we expect differences between them? Uh, and so it's difficult to, in some sense, do some of this research because we're lumping people into categories that exist on a spectrum, uh, and every person is different. And so there's difficulty in defining the differences between the groups. There's also differences in that we would be measuring outward behavior as if it's always reflective of inward virtue. Uh, and so we've gone back and forth a little bit in that conversation. Which direction does it go? Is it cyclical, like Dr. Davis shared with us? Uh, but but what's how do we separate behavior? Uh, but where he landed was this assertion that the group comparative prediction should be plausible, that if we take a group and a group, we can compare them, and it's reasonable for us to believe that uh, there would be increased virtue, if you will, or increased virtuous behavior in the Christians over the non-Christians. And thankfully, in some sense, the evidence seems to bear that out. Uh, Dr. Miller walked through different uh, measurements of behaviors, of tendencies of Christians versus non-Christians. And generally speaking, they were favorable towards Christians, that they were less likely to engage in problematic behaviors. Uh, they were more virtuous. They gave, gave more to charity. They volunteered more. Um, they were kinder to other people. Uh, side note, you said nobody uses that word non-malevolence. Uh, we do in the, in the counseling world, so I've used that word before in a classroom. Uh, so I hear you. Uh, but there was preliminary suggestive evidence, I appreciated that verbiage, that Christians tended towards more virtuous behavior than non-Christians. But you gave us the caution, I appreciated it, that that research is correlational, not causational. So we have to be able to hold that rightly. We can't presume too much of that, that research. Just some personal thoughts, personal reflections. Uh, first and foremost, as a counselor, I value evidence-based practices. I don't accept practices simply because evidence shows it, but I value it. I think science matters, observation matters. And so I appreciate the search for empirical data. I don't get to do nearly as much of that as I would love to do. So I appreciate the, the intrinsic value of science and numbers and data. Uh, I like that. Um, I'm very glad that the data bears out the hypothesis that, that you presented. I also want to recognize that we have to continue to hold that tension of internal virtue versus external behavior. Uh, that, that we can't always correlate the two. Dr. Smith, we've talked some about that. You've mentioned that. Um, and yet, I would assert that Scripture gives this sort of primarily one-directional um, path. Uh, Luke 6.45, it's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks, right? We recognize a tree by its fruit, um, and the roots drive the fruit, if you will. Uh, and so I want to hold that there as well, that Perhaps it is that we can see external behavior and say, to use the analogy, that's an apple, and an apple comes from an apple tree that has apple roots. Now, are there exceptions? Perhaps. Uh, but generally speaking, I would, I would want to hold that. Uh, I also want to ask the question, this is a larger question I'll come back to. Um, I'm not sure I have the exact answer, but should the true end of sanctification and spiritual formation be, in fact, virtue. Now, let me, let me explain that for a minute before you take a deep breath. Um, I, I wonder if the external virtue is more reflective of the inward change per our last conversation. And so should we maybe nuance it to say, yes, we want to see virtue, 
but we really want to see virtue as a result of a changed heart, and that's what we're getting at. Um, I don't know that any of us would necessarily disagree with that, but, but just a question that came up as, we, as I listened to that presentation. The second presentation was Dr. Hurt. Uh, she walked us through, um, her paper was in the furnace of charity. She's pulling that from Augustine's verbiage, uh, formed for love. Uh, and she argued for a recapturing of an ecstatic eudaimonism. I hope I said that right, eudaimonism. Um, and that is what invites people, read her definition, into a search for flourishing in which they discover that their own flourishing is simply a byproduct of discovering and devoting themselves to that which is good. Uh, she said the end of formation is God, goodness, with a capital G, itself, to be formed to love God and all creatures, including oneself, as they are loved by God. So she wants to see a recapturing of that that she sees throughout uh, church history. And so she walked us through that history. Uh, it was enlightening for me to see that movement through kind of Catholicism and the priestly formation of the 20th century, uh, through kind of modern positive psychology of Seligman, uh, and then through Irenaeus and Augustine. Uh, it was really interesting to me to see that thread that she drew for us. Uh, and specifically, she landed uh, with the example of Augustine's almsgiving. Um, that, that was an example of um, this, this flourishing and learning, and that we can learn through doing the virtue, and our hearts are formed by it. Um, and she ended with this, um, the contemporary theologian Willie Jennings, uh, and shared essentially the message that uh, we're just not there yet. Um, as we're being formed and we're growing and being sanctified, if I can add that word, uh, we're, just, we're just not there yet. Uh, we still have a little ways to go. Some personal thoughts and reflection then. Um, she asserted, Irenaeus primarily asserted, that we are being formed towards something, and that end matters. Um, as I heard Dr. Davis, you speaking, I saw some parallels there, of course, that that end matters. Um, now, I think there was a, a slight difference in what Dr. Hurt would say was the end, was delight in God, um, to delight in the good, versus sanctification becoming more like God, loving more. Uh, I wonder if they're two sides of the same coin in, in some sense, uh, but I think we would do well to, to nuance that properly. I uh, appreciated uh, as well from her this communal nature of formation, of spiritual growth, that that matters. I'm going to come back to that as well. Uh, she said at one point that flourishing is both a spiritual and an ethical enterprise, uh, that we are in an ethical sense. I, I should be moving to, towards formation for the good of my brother, uh, which we don't often think about that way, right? Uh, we think about it in a larger context, but we don't often think about that my formation directly impacts the formation of those around me. And that goes beyond uh, just my immediate family, right? My spiritual formation certainly impacts my children or my husband, but it also impacts the rest of my local church in some sense. So I appreciated that, that verbiage. She, she went through that quickly, but it stood out to me. I thought of the question as well, bullet four, uh, what, what must we know of the end of formation as we continue on that journey? She, she made the comment that we don't always know the end, that that gets formed as we are being formed. We don't know the end. Um, how would we wrestle with that? Should we wrestle with that? Um, and what must we know of where we're going um, as we're going along? I don't know that I have the answer to that, but that came to mind. And then lastly, I uh, make the statement, we must take care to understand the end properly. Uh, this was perhaps one of the greatest things that stood out to me in, in her lecture, and I, I wish she was still here, because uh, we could dialogue about it for a moment. Um, I would submit, and I'll come back to this more later, that the true end of formation, the goal, is conformity to the image of Christ. I think the scriptures bear that out. There are, are numerous passages, even some that she used, uh, that says that we were, Romans 8, 29, predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. 2 Corinthians 3, 18 says we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Dr. Davis, you drew that out. 
Um, and so part of me wonders if it's useful to uh, I mean, nuance that a little bit and say that the true end is being conformed into the image and the byproduct uh, is delight in the good, is delight in God. Um, just a thought there. The third presentation was Kelly Capick. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you all, as a counselor, I sat there and I was nodding over and over. I, I enjoyed that presentation because it was it was very practical. Um, I appreciate it. He began with kind of the context of his writing, uh, sharing the story of his wife who uh, has suffered with cancer and now continues to suffer with chronic pain. Um, and it is very real in his context that theology has to have feet to it. It, it matters, right? Uh, as a counselor, again, who sits across from suffering people, this is where I live. Uh, and I have to be able to reckon with theological truths and realities because um, they come to bear every week. He then talked about this internal struggle that is produced by suffering. Um, he, if I'm honest and transparent, that hit a chord with me um, because as I've walked through a season in my own life um, of suffering, particular loss, uh, that's where I found myself was asking really deep and hard theological questions that um, didn't have pat answers. So when he said we cannot give people pat answers, Pat answers, I wanted to not be Baptist for a minute and say amen and amen, right? We, we, we just can't do that. I teach my counseling students not to do that, right? Counseling students? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, but he talks about this, this fear of divine indifference uh, that sometimes we fear, is God really good to me or is he indifferent to me? Uh, I have a client right now, counselee right now, who is wrestling with some of these things, and she'll say all day long, God is good, but he's not good to me, so why should I trust him? Uh, but that's what we fear. We fear what he called divine indifference. But suffering, as he said, brings to the surface some of these problematic views of God. If everything's going well, we can say, yes, God is good, and God is loving, and God is kind. But in the minute that we suffer and suffer deeply, we really have to reckon with, is God good? How can God be good and this happen? And so that's what he was reckoning with. He then spent most of his time walking through these three categories, faith, hope, and love. Uh, he drew his paper out of chapter nine of his book, uh, Embodied Hope, I believe it's called. It was fantastic. I would encourage you to read it. Uh, but walks through these three categories. First, he started with faith, echoing this idea, this assertion that physical difficulties provoke spiritual struggles and brings our faith often into question. And yet, there is what he called safety in that community, in the sense that in the community of faith, my brother or sister can have faith for me. Now, this isn't salvific faith, right? He was clear to articulate that. But when I am wrestling with my faith, my brother or sister can intercede on my behalf to God, and he can speak for God to me. And there's this communal sense of faith that is shored up in the midst of suffering. But then this extra piece that he said, we have to believe in God's benevolence to me, that, that that's part of faith. The second piece there he explained was hope that hope that must be anchored in the person of Christ. Uh, it cannot be anywhere else or else it's shaky hope. It's unfounded hope. Uh, but that hope is what nourishes our faith. Uh, when we lose hope, our faith is what's wavering there. Uh, so that hope nourishes our faith. Uh, and he spent a little bit of time talking about remembrance and that often we hope because we remember God's goodness in the past, even if it doesn't feel like that in the present. Uh, when he said that, I thought about quite often in the Old Testament, right, especially the Psalms, uh, what, what are the people told to do? Remember, 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 remember when I brought you out of Egypt. Remember when I delivered you. Remember, fill in the blank. Uh, and there were some echoes of that in his talk that we find our hope, the Israelites found their hope from remembering God's character because of what he had done before, before that situation. And lastly, he talked about love. He said that faith and hope need love, that without love, faith and hope uh, really are empty and they could be problematic. Um, 
And yet, he, he made this statement. He said, love for another, love for the neighbor, is an invitation to suffer. Uh, it is not actually loving if I'm only there for my brother or sister in the good times. But if I truly love them, I'm invited into their suffering with them. And I do weep with them when they weep and rejoice with them when they rejoice. Um, so he's holding those three things together, but would give priority to the love in some personal thoughts and reflections. I mentioned earlier that suffering does tend to evoke these existential questions. That was certainly true in my life. It's true of numerous counselees that I have seen. I also thought about, he was talking a lot about Luther, which was just fun to, to learn about. Uh, but this holistic view of persons, I think, demands holistic prayers. And it seemed like Luther had this real sense of unity in his personhood, if I can say it that way, such that when he had physical ailments, he recognized spiritual struggles are coming out of that uh, and asked for prayers for his spiritual um, bolstering more so than his physical healing. So this holistic understanding of people leading to holistic prayer. Uh, I loved when he talked about that the mirroring of uh, well, the, the, the Christ offering himself as the feast in famine. Uh, do you remember he, he talked about at the end that his wife wrote in uh, the, the side of his book uh, that in famine, Christ offers himself as the feast. And when he said that, the image that came to my mind, should I say that now, Benjamin? That what I thought about uh, was the marriage supper of the lamb, uh, that at the end, yes, we will have the marriage supper as the bride, uh, but in some sense, we will be feasting on Christ and his glory for all of eternity. So I made that parallel in, in my mind. I mentioned this briefly earlier, but as a counselor, I would also echo that we cannot give pat answers, uh, that healing and flourishing must be communal. Those two things have to come hand in hand. Uh, and so when, when someone sits across from me and says, why did God allow my child to die? I cannot say, well, it's for his glory and your good. Those things are true. They're absolutely true. Uh, but in that moment, that's not compassionate. Uh, and so understanding kind of the complexity of taking good, solid theology and formation, sanctification, and being able to contextualize it to a person who is suffering and who is hurting, we need to be able to do that well and not be harmful to them. And yet, I continually push my, my counselees towards community, that healing and growth happens in the context of community. I'm a very small part of that as a counselor, right? I'm part of their community, but more often than not, I'm not in their local church community. So I want to push them towards that and towards formation and growth and sanctification, help in the midst of suffering within their uh, local church community. Lastly, uh, a thought, we have to know people in order to speak uh, to God's goodness and the depths of depravity. We, we constantly live in this tension in counseling through suffering, that God is good, and our experiences do not negate that ever. God's goodness is not changed when my experience is not good. And yet, depravity is real, right? Things are broken, there are things in this world uh, and things that I have experienced, things that I have especially heard from people I've counseled that I never want to even speak of again. This world is broken. Uh, and, but in order to speak to both of those, I have to know the person sitting across from me. I can't give them false faith or false hope, and I really don't love them unless I know them. Uh, and so from a counselor's perspective, we have to know people well, listen to them well, in order to speak God's goodness and the depths of depravity, both of those at the same time, and do that wisely. Uh, so you can see, again, why the counselor in me loved that presentation. <laughs> Number four, uh, Dr. Davis, you shared with us this morning, which I appreciated from a more pastoral perspective, which was fantastic. Uh, and, and you shared with us that God's own glory is the end of that formation. That's the goal. Everything that God does, he does for his glory, uh, and, and we affirm that, right? Everything within our formation is for God's glory, and secondarily, we, we receive delight because of that. When we 
do things for God's glory, we're formed into his image, that should lead to delight. It does lead to delight. But sin has come into the picture, right? Thanks, Adam and Eve. Sin has come in and it's marred us. It's broken things such that God has to reshape us. Um, The potter has to reshape us, the clay, because we're broken. Uh, But you also drew out for us, Dr. Davis, that uh, formation has to be seen both in the original creation, the image of God, and in the new creation, the image of Christ. Uh, And and sometimes we don't understand kind of the nuance between those two. Uh, They are kind of same but different. Um, But we were created in the image of God. Sin came in and broke that. And now we're being reformed into the image of Christ in new creation. Uh, And I appreciate you drew out that we are being shaped by God from glory to glory. We are glorious now. Um, I don't know about you. I don't feel so glorious most days. Uh, But praise God that what he declares to be true is true, right? But we are being shaped by God from glory to glory. And then you laid out for us what you called a pathway to Christian maturity. Remember the chart up here, the four boxes. You still have the green sheets. Uh, That's fantastic. I'm going to use it in class, but I'll give credit to you. (laughs) Uh, This kind of four-piece knowledge to faith to character and action or behavior. You drew out several things here within the kind of knowledge sphere that that is both factual and experiential. Uh, I learn true facts, things that people tell me, but I also learn what I experience. And I put both of those things together, and that is knowledge. Uh, So we have knowledge. And then we have faith. And some components of faith are things like our beliefs, things like our convictions, uh, reliance on the Holy Spirit. Uh, But knowledge should lead to faith. And then through that faith, we are to develop character, Uh, And character encompasses lots of things, but some of those are the affections, the desires or our will, uh, our thoughts and our emotions, such that it leads to, should lead to, virtue. All of those play into that. And that gets formed deep within us. And then it leads to action. So the last part of this cycle that then continues on action, our habits, our sin, the things that we do, our behaviors, Uh, And it becomes this cycle of what we do, this pathway to Christian maturity. And it produces, you remember on the back of that green sheet, it produces particular things. Our behavior evidences what has happened, the change that has happened within us. Some personal thoughts here. Uh, I would affirm that we must uphold that God's motivation of our formation is our own, his own glory. Sorry, let me be very clear about that one his own glory. Uh, If we change that, we have lost, uh, I think, a lot. Um, So we have to uphold that God is working towards his own glory uh, and that he is right in doing so. We don't work for our own glory because we're fallen and broken, but God is perfect. He is good. He is without error. Uh, So he rightly has glory, right? We, We work towards that. That's a motivation for our formation. I also appreciated the reminder of the process of salvation, if I can say it that way. Uh, You know, those are conversations we have in Sunday school that we use these words, uh, but sometimes we just rattle them off, right? We were justified, we are sanctified, and then we're glorified. Uh, But it's just good to be reminded that God justifies us, that he sanctifies us. We are and are not yet glorified. Um, And yet, I appreciate this is more from last night's panel, this view of eternal growth. Um, We will be glorified, and yet we will not remain static. We will continue to grow for all of eternity in that perpetual history lesson, if you will, uh, which I'm really excited about. Uh, But that eternal growth Lastly, you you mentioned this, but I just want to draw it out uh, even a little bit more. We have to uphold the role of the Holy Spirit in formation. We'll talk in a few minutes about this dual agency, this thread that's come through these presentations. But uh, just affirming and reiterating that the Spirit 
is an ever active part in each part of that cycle. Um, I don't justify myself. I don't sanctify myself. I don't glorify myself. It is the spirit who is active and primary in our formation. I just want to reiterate that for us. Presentation number five. We're almost there. Uh, Dr. Johnson uh, shared with us, this is uh, the title, Will We Ever Again Bother With Scripture? Um, Just as a side note, I got the slides ahead of time, and I saw that title, and I thought, Gosh, I hope we do. <laughs> uh, I tend to like the Bible. Uh, we like the Bible here. Uh, but, but the title, I, I appreciate it. I understand where you're going with that. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that there's been this recent renewal of uh, focus on ritual and liturgy, uh, you know, the timeline of the books there. Uh, but even then, our understanding of it is somewhat lacking, uh, that we don't understand or we don't incorporate really uh, liturgical practices and rituals. Uh, in our church context, um, you also drew out this reality that there seems to be an increasing disconnect between knowledge and understanding. Uh, And and those are my words kind of applied to what you were saying. Um, And you talked about biblical literacy, which I would phrase as knowledge, um, that that's not the point, right? Uh, Which as a mama of four littles, I think I want you to know about Noah, Uh, But we have to go beyond that. So biblical literacy is not the point, seminary students. Uh, Biblical literacy matters, but it's not the ultimate end. Where we need to be pushing ourselves towards is fluency, is this application uh, that we can understand it such that we can uh, apply it, contextualize it, we can do more with it than just regurgitate facts. Uh, The educator in me is bringing up the image of Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, that we want to move beyond just a regurgitation of information, we need to be able to synthesize and analyze and even um, apply and teach and create. I think that's kind of what you're getting at there. You drew out this idea of the issues with the current methods of personal devotionals. Um, as a frequent writer of those devotionals, we're just going to leave that right there. Uh, but, I, but I hear your point uh, that, that is, it can be sporadic, Uh, If we simply want to do a thematic study or if we want to do a book study even, oftentimes those are kind of micro-dosed, to your point, uh, and what can be accomplished in 10 minutes in a day. Uh, And that's simply insufficient for us. We need a deeper knowledge. And so you talked about how we remedy that, what we need to do. Uh, I love the phrase you used, a vigorous conversation. Uh, Because, yes, we need that. We need a more holistic conversation uh, around these, this, this biblical fluency. And that should be communal. It should be done with one another. Um, it should be done in a way that's intellectual. We're not flattening what scripture has to say. Uh, the depths of the riches of wisdom in God's word is incredible. Uh, we, sh- we should be asking hard questions, the right questions, but we should be asking hard questions. And rigorous spiritual conversations uh, we should be asking about how do these how do these things affect who I am, my mind, my heart, my soul, those vigorous conversations. Another remedy you gave was to teach across the curriculum. Uh, the educator and me loved that, uh, that we should be teaching the depths of wisdom from Scripture, whether we're teaching counseling or theology or physics. Right? We can draw in, in different ways, but we draw from Scripture in each of those. Another remedy might be what what, uh, I would call out-of-the-norm reading. Uh, You call disruptive reading. Uh, So things like uh, reading an entire book of the Bible or reading a passage over and over and over and over, listening to the Word instead of reading it, um, disruptive reading, out-of-the-norm, kind of gets us out of our ruts, if we will. Uh, We could talk about kind of the neurological aspect of that, uh, but gets us out of those ruts and just brings things afresh to our minds. Um, And lastly, expanding our view of reading beyond personal devotionals. Uh, This is a a struggle at times in our world of fast-paced go and do. That that micro-dosing of devotional uh, tends to fit in better, but it's not productive for us. It's not good for us, to your point of the students in class not knowing uh, anything in Scripture other than regurgitation. Some thoughts here. Uh, Again, I appreciate the affirmation that we have to have understanding 
and be able to apply it. Ultimately, if we can't apply it, that understanding really doesn't do much. Uh, so it's, it's not worthless. We need it to build on, but we have to build on it. Uh, and I would argue that both of them must be taught and modeled. Uh, this is the educator's job, right? Is that we both teach things, we convey understanding, and then we model or demonstrate the application um, that we are teaching with our words and our actions, if you will. As you were talking about the differences between literacy and fluency, my mind went to kind of a parallel between knowledge and wisdom uh, in the sense of we need, we need knowledge, we need uh, an understanding of fact to apply wisdom. Uh, but what does scripture push us to consistently, especially the Proverbs, pushes us towards wisdom uh, based on understanding, based on knowledge, but it pushes us towards wisdom. Uh, and I wonder if there's a loose parallel there that just like the relationship between knowledge and wisdom is literacy and fluency. I think too that if we affirm the sufficiency of scripture, hopefully everyone would raise their hand in that, uh, that we, we have to go that far. We have to act accordingly uh, such that if there is this depth of wisdom within scripture and it pushes us towards application, if we really say we believe scripture is sufficient, then we have to live like it, right? We, we have to apply it. Uh, we don't just learn the information and do nothing with it, or we don't just learn uh, very shallow information. Lastly, Dr. Todd Hall, thank you for the presentation on relational spirituality. Uh, I want to walk through what you shared with us. First, you talked about the connection crisis, uh, this decline in mental health uh, as it's related to social and spiritual disconnection. Uh, I remember at the beginning of the, the COVID pandemic, and we, were, we were locked down for maybe a month at this point, and my husband said, uh, what do you expect? What do you think things are going to look like when we get through this whole thing? I think it's going to be longer than we think. And I said, I expect that I will see more anxiety and depression cases and more marital conflict. <laughs> uh, we see both of those. Uh, but some of that is because we were created to live in relationship. God has forever existed in relationship with himself. He created us in relationship with him. And, and the pandemic disrupted that. And that's what led to loneliness and isolation that you drew out. And that then leads to anxiety and depression and conflict in some sense. Uh, but this decline in mental health, um, I see a lot of teenagers as well. So I would offer a hearty amen uh, to this one, <laughs> social and spiritual disconnection there. But then you offered a relational paradigm, this relational view of the image of God, of the, the reflection of the Trinity. And, and I just kind of laid that out a second ago, but the Trinity is relational. God in and of himself is relational. And in some sense, sanctification then is relational. We are formed in this context of relationship. You spent a good bit of time on attachment, uh, which I give lectures in class on attachment. So that was, that was just fun to hear from uh, someone else. But this, these attachment filters that we tend to hold, uh, we may not recognize them. But if we have safety and security, that leads to comfort. But if those things are lacking, it leads to discomfort. It leads to problems. Uh, and those problems manifest themselves in very clear ways. Remember the, the chart with the four different types of attachment. Three of those four, what we might call insecure attachment, um, those are problematic. We can see that very clearly. So this attach, these attachment filters translate into adulthood. Uh, they matter. Um, this deep growth was the last point that you uh, walked us through, that 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 takes time. Uh, I tell my counselees, your problems didn't develop overnight, and so they're not going to be fixed overnight. Uh, so we have to do the hard work of setting goals and embarking on what you call a winding journey. Uh, we talk about that often in my counseling office. Uh, but that takes this both implicit and explicit knowing, right? So I can't look at someone with these, this problematic attachment and say, you can trust people. Even as their counselor, you can trust me. It just doesn't work that way. 
I could beat that drum all day long, but until they deeply know that that is true by their experience that affirms that, uh, they don't actually know it, and that deep growth isn't going to happen. I appreciate it as well. You talked about in incremental growth, that those little changes, they matter. I tell my counselees, any progress is progress. Uh, it can be this big, but it's progress, and it matters. And eventually, a lot of this bigs will amount to a whole, whole lot. Uh, we just have to keep doing the things. Some personal thoughts and reflections. Lastly, um, anecdotally, I see these attachment styles and filters uh, in my own counseling room. They matter. Uh, I would argue that they are formative but not determinative. I think you drew that out a little bit. Uh, and they can be deeply formative, but they are not determinative. We still have some agency in how we respond uh, to our past events, trauma even, um, and we can have the agency to work towards better patterns, uh, but it takes a lot of effort. So not determinative, but formative. I appreciate it as well, this statement you started with and ended with, we are loved into loving. Uh, we love and we're being transformed towards love when we recognize and respond to God's love for us, right? The Apostle John said that I love because he first loved us. Uh, and so in no way am I the initiator of loving God, right? God loved me. He showed that to me. Uh, and if I can show a little bit of my Calvinist cards, I couldn't help but love him back, right? Um, and so we are loved into loving. There's this reciprocity, but it doesn't start with me. Uh, this deep growth, uh, I wondered if there is this parallel to literacy versus fluency, the uh, internal versus external kind of knowing, uh, implicit, explicit knowing. Uh, and then lastly, we relate because God himself relates. We are patterned after God as image bearers. Uh, I think it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Let me draw out now just a couple of overarching thoughts, some common threads um, one or two of these are more my, my overarching thoughts. A few of these are common threads. Uh, but the first thing that I think has come out of these discussions is that we have to know the end of formation. We have to know where we're going, right? Uh, it doesn't really do well if my husband and I get in the car and we just start driving. Um, we don't know where we're going, right? That might be a fun adventure, but it doesn't do much. Uh, I have to know where I'm going in order to get there. And so we have to ask the question, what is the end of formation? A couple of the presenters addressed this. Uh, this is my um, proposal, if you will. Uh, I would see the end of formation as conformity to the image of Christ. That's what God is doing. I think that's the purpose of formation. But very quickly afterwards, such that we bring glory to him and such that we love God more fully and such that we delight in his goodness. And I put them in this order on purpose because I think God's glory is much more important than my delight. All right, so see that as a kind of a priority as well. Uh, but us moving towards the image of Christ, I think that's what Irenaeus was saying. I think most of us would, would jive with most of that at least, but that's what I would propose to us. Another common thread that I saw was this communal nature of formation. We live in a very individualized Western society of uh, I can do the things by myself. And I think all of us are honest. We would think that's just the way I prefer it. It's easier that way. I don't have to rely on somebody else. Uh, but constantly in these presentations, I heard this communal nature focus. Um, Kelly Capick said uh, this, this phrase that saints represent others to God in intercession and God to others in the midst of trial. I think that's a beautiful picture for us. Um, Dr. Hurt talked about Augustine, this furnace of charity for unity, that we're being formed um, in that for love and unity with one another. I think about, too, just my own reflection. And we, we see in Revelation this picture of the bride uh, that word bride is singular. Uh, so in some sense, we as community who have been formed are unified as the bride of Christ. There's this um, kind of singularity, this unity to us. Uh, and yet we want to uphold, um, I am responsible for cultivating faith and virtue. So this communal nature doesn't 
negate personal responsibility, but it orients me, right? It gives me the proper perspective for doing so because if I'm failing in my formation, I'm failing the bride, if that makes sense. Um, I might even add the historical community uh, certainly, I can't, uh, you know, call up Augustine and say, hey, what do you think about this? Uh, but the church fathers, the uh, folks throughout the history of the church have spoken in particular ways that are formative and, and informative to us. Uh, and so could we perhaps even see this communal nature uh, through the lens of history as well and some continuity there? Another common thread that I saw was this dynamic, this kind of process nature of formation. Uh, it doesn't happen instantaneously. We aren't zapped, as we talked about yesterday. Uh, too bad, right? But we, we do uphold a moment of justification, and yet we uphold progressive sanctification. Uh, Luther drew this out, the process of sanctification. Uh, we're just not there yet. Um, Capic, Kelly Capic drew this parallel to God's familiarity and comfort with process in Genesis. Uh, in creation, God didn't just speak and it all was. He spread that out uh, and walked through a process of creation, such as our formation. It's a process. Um, Dr. Johnson talked about moving beyond the knowing. There's some uh, process that happens there, that that's not just an instantaneous thing. Uh, and we drew out this idea of mutual agency, that both God and man do something. But as Dr. Hurt, uh, I believe Dr. Hurt said, those are non-competitive, right? It's not as if God does something and that negates me doing something as well. Uh, we're cooperating in that, uh, that dynamic kind of change there. Uh, but I love, I think, Dr. Davis, you drew this out, this continual formation, even in eternity. Uh, that this, this isn't all the growing there is. Uh, the growing will look different, but this is not all the formation that's happening, uh, which is just exciting to me. Um, next, number four, this one, there's, there's one more after this, uh, is this holistic understanding of formation. Uh, I would assert, I would propose that our entire beings are being conformed into the image of Christ. I can't separate out just my desires or just my thoughts or just my relationships, right? My entire self should be and is being conformed into the image of Christ. Um, and so we are multifaceted beings. I don't know that any of us could articulate all of the nuances that go into that. I don't know that we need to, uh, except to say that conformity is also multifaceted. It's not flat. It's not just spiritual. Um, there's, there's a lot that's happening in this formation. Uh, and this connection of the spiritual to the physical, um, Dr. Capic was drawing out from Luther for us, the physical suffering often draws out that spiritual wrestling. We, we are so holistic that we can't separate ourselves out from us, nor, nor are we meant to. Uh, that separation at death is abnormal, right? Uh, and we, it will be remedied. A last thread that I wanted to draw, and more just echoing, uh, is the necessity of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is both instructive to us, he teaches us, he gives us understanding, as the scriptures say, uh, and corrective. Uh, he brings conviction. Uh, and so when we, um, when we need instruction, he gives instruction. When we need correction, he brings it in lots of different ways, in our knowledge, in our affections, and in our behavior. Uh, we cannot negate the role of the Holy Spirit. Uh, there is this dual agency, but primarily and ultimately that's done by God. Uh, as I was thinking about this, I thought about that that essentially is the fundamental difference between Christians and non-Christians to loop us back to Dr. Miller's uh, talk. Can we expect reasonable, can we expect differences? Uh, yes, because non-believers don't have the Holy Spirit doing the work of the Holy Spirit in them. They do have, by common grace, a conscience that gives testimony to God, right? Paul says in Romans. Um, but they don't have the Spirit in them as we would, convicting them and bringing true understanding. So they're limited in their ability uh, to be formed, if we could say it that way. 
Two more slides. First, the application as a counselor. I will try to be brief on this part. Uh, I could probably do a whole lecture just on this. Uh, but first, my concern as a counselor, your concern as counselors, must be with the holistic formation of the counselee. I cannot just seek to change their mind. I cannot just seek to change their affections or change their will. I have to see them as a holistic being, and their formation has to be holistic as well, and we have to be moving forward holistically. Uh, there's a process there. But I also have to be concerned about their formation in the context of their local church. Um, it is incredibly difficult, if I can speak practically for a minute, for me to counsel people who are not already embedded in a local church. But more often than not, not always, but more often than not, I'm counseling people who are not embedded in a local church. And I think that that says something. I want to be careful, but I think that says something. I want to be concerned, I have to be concerned about their formation in the context of where God has placed them in their Christian community. Um, that, that matters. I think that the dynamic and lifelong reality of formation should grant us patience and perspective. As I talk to my counseling students, particularly in our practicum courses, uh, we talk about that when we uh, begin counseling someone, we are committing to them. And that's a good and beautiful thing. That's a necessary thing. Uh, but I share with them that my longest lasting counselee, I've been seeing her for nine years. Uh, there's some patience there, y'all. Uh, nine years. Uh, but, but the Lord gives us that because we know that formation takes more than nine years, right? And I happen to get the privilege to walk with her through this stage of that. But it grants us patience. It grants us perspective that that formation is never fully complete in this life. So I can walk with them. Lastly, here, application as a counselor. Uh, in suffering, true hope, true faith has to come from the person of Jesus. I am not the hope. You, friends, are not the hope of people who come to you for help. You cannot be because you will fail them. I will fail them every single time. I have to be the tool, the vessel, that the Lord uses to point back to himself. And that true hope, true faith, true love comes in and through the person of Jesus. Otherwise, it is lacking, severely lacking. Lastly, as an educator, uh, I believe most of the presenters are educated, formal educators in some sense, uh, but all of you teach other people in some ways. Maybe it's in Sunday school, maybe it's from a pulpit, maybe it's in a classroom, uh, but there, I think there's some clear application for us as educators as well. Just as with the last slide, our concern as educators has to be with the holistic formation of our students, not just their mind. So I, as a professor, cannot stand up and just dump information as if that's sufficient, especially not in counseling, because I need them to do something with it, right? Uh, I have to be concerned with their holistic, full-person formation. I appreciate Southeastern's focus on this. Um, that, is, that is real in our courses. Second, the educational institution, I think, should be one of holistic formation, and should push us towards living out their formation. Uh, that again, it's not just an intellectual exercise, it's not just me saying something, dumping knowledge, uh, but this institution that we're in can be a place of holistic formation, and I can encourage them towards that. I can see my students practice that application, and I can help form them to do that better. So I have the best job in the world. I get to do that, we should do that. Thirdly, as my student's sister, I am my student's sister, it is my ethical responsibility to work towards their formation and point them towards Christian community. Uh, I am not just the professor standing up in front of a classroom or a, a lecture, uh, but I am each of my students' sister, and I have an ethical obligation towards them. Otherwise, I'm not loving them as my neighbor well. Uh, and I think we should take that seriously, their formation and their engagement in Christian community that works towards their formation. Lastly, I need to understand that the, every student in my classroom, every student in your classroom, uh, is working towards a particular end, conformity to the image of Christ in love for his glory and for delight in him. And that orients what I teach. 
Uh, it doesn't mean necessarily that I'm explicitly teaching something different, but how am I going about that? Why am I directing them towards a particular end? Uh, I want to see them more importantly, be more conformed to the image of Christ than to know a particular counseling skill. Because if they're conformed to the image of Christ, they will love their neighbor. That skill will take care of itself, right? So I need to know that, that orientation and the end to which they're working, all right? That's all I have. I think we were going to offer discussion, right?